it's been a couple of days since the Eagles press conference that they gave before the NFL draft upcoming this week. But let's look at 11 takeaways from the Howard Roseman and Nick Sirianni presser that's leading up to the draft. What's up? It's your boy Sintron. Come back after another announcement slash news video. And I kid you not, that's my real name. Yeah, we're back, man. Um, yeah, I'm excited to get into this one. Drop the Bijan video yesterday. Yeah, I didn't feel so sad about it, but it is what it is. 11 takeaways from Howie Roseman's and Nick Sirianni's press pre-draft press conference. So, you see these two guys, they look ready, stoic. Let's go, men. <laughs> All right, number one, what would it take for the Eagles to finally pull the trigger on a running back or linebacker in the first round of the draft? Um, they get into it later, but he says here, a unique player. Um, so, and this is where I disagree with the author of this uh, article. It says, there are plenty of high importance positions to pick from, whether that's quarterback, not in the cards for us. Offensive tackle, not in immediate impact position like Howie uh, said he wanted. Defensive tackle, could be, but it's still a rotational position. Edge rusher, rotational, because we have two guys that are gonna start in front of the, that guy that we bring in. Cornerback, need seasoning, so no. Wide receiver, they gotta learn playbook, so no. Um, and they said lightning rod player here, obviously is B. John Robinson, and that's a guy who can ha come in and have an immediate impact because of the nature of the position. It's easier to, to come in and acclimate to the NFL. And um, they hit the ground running, no pun intended. But I, to go back to the original question, uh, he is a generational talent. He's being compared to, at worst, like an Adrian James, who's, I mean, a Hall of Famer, but not in the same class as a LaDainian Tomlinson or a Peterson, a AD, all day. And, he, and then he's AD souped up because he has the receiving skills to threaten a defense on the perimeter, in the screen game, um, short uh, short yardage, um, in the slot, as a natural receiver down the field, can uh, run a gamut of the routes, and still add to his repertoire. But this is a pre-made player coming in, pre-packaged. He comes out like this, like so, man. It just ah, there's so much potential there. I almost want to go and redo that video from yesterday because man, there's so much I didn't even hit on that Bijan can do. And like that, you know, stats, um, information that highlights the dangerousness of adding this guy to the Eagles offense that the league certainly would hate and want to ban us, bar us from getting him. So, all right, let's go to number two. Would the Eagles feel comfortable drafting Georgia D tackle Jalen Carter, who's talented but comes up with off the field concerns? Um, I, I mean, I'm, I'm up in the air with this one. It all comes down to their research. Uh, they have two Georgia players, N'Kobe Dean and one Jordan Davis, played who played next to him um, on the D line to ask him to ask them about you know his character concerns and um, they interviewed his D coordinator there as well. So he they most likely just threw some information out there like, well, okay, what's he like? That's off the off the book, off the records, um, but also. They have this guy here, Chief, Chief Security Officer Dom DeSandro, that they, you know, tasked with finding out, you know, the who, what, when, where, why, and how about these players. So um, they do their due diligence. You know, you best believe that. And, um, yeah, this guy, I mean, I, I'd like to say they wouldn't be out on him, but I, I don't believe that smokescreen that, you know, that most of the team trying to throw out there you took him off off a draft board that, that could be just like what i just said a smoke screen to uh try and discourage other teams and they're all pros at this they all you know um are well versed in the machinations of the nfl and things like that they might let something as flimsy as a oh you know what anything to do with them um in the public sphere pr move um stunt <laughs> their their own moves and uh remove them from the equation so I mean, this is, it's all a, a head game at this point. You're throwing out, you know, these feints, these jabs, the setup, you know, the killer uppercuts and punches and stuff like that. Like it's Javante Davis versus Ryan Garcia. Go Davis, tank Davis, baby, let's go. Um, but anyways, it's, it's, it's all, it could be all a shell game. No, it, it is a shell game. And uh, it's, it's who, can, who, who can lie the best and who can fool their opponents the best. So um, a lot of subterfuge going on. So, I mean, I don't know. But, I mean, I would, you know, I can't lean one direction or the other. 
Um, number three, does the fact that the Eagles don't have any picks in the fourth, fifth, and sixth rounds make it more likely that Ohio will trade, make trades to add some? Look at history. I mean, he, he wants to, you know, have as many picks as he can in any given draft, um, ideally. But like last draft, we, you know, we, we eschewed the fourth and fifth uh, to trade up for uh, uh, for to trade up for Jordan Davis. That being said, um, that was a special scenario. We really wanted the guy, wanted that player. Um, and going back to back drafts with you know limited picks is not ideal and definitely not you know doesn't fit with the control theme that Howie you know loves to have even though we do have 12 selections in the 2024 draft upcoming next year um that being said like he's not gonna um I'm not gonna okay get into that later sacrifice picks for you know from next year to borrow from Peter to pay Paul but yeah he we only have two uh, day three picks in by way of you know seven two seventh rounders and that's just that's just too much time for me to believe that how he wants to sit there and there is a wealth of players um at different positions and especially with us lacking o-line depth um maybe one in a receiver or two maybe getting some linebackers um safeties i mean so there's so many positions that we want to address not even just starters but like depth wise and guys that can be future starters as well and there's plenty of depth to be had at different positions and with others, with the focus being on, you know, quarterbacks, it's going to push down non-quarterback positions and, you know, make other guys available that would otherwise have not been in a regular year. Um, or just with, with uh, depending on the year, with the team's needs, you know, so it all is a fluctuating uh, fortress of uh, instability, <laughs> to be quite honest. All right. Number four, how does the fifth year option affect the value of a pick at 30 versus high second round picks? Uh, I, mean, it, I mean, definitely at the tail end of the round, you got to believe that teams, they want to, you know, tr trade up and grab a guy so that they can, you know, have that fifth year, the controllable year. And like I said here, it's all about extra, extra control. So like a guy, Hinton Hooker, expected to go second to late first. Um, some team that, you know, really wants him, really wants to develop him, sees him as the quarterback of the future, has tabbed him, is willing to trade up, you know, of course, sacrifice some picks along with that, some um, draft capital, and um, have him for another a fifth year. You know, they, depending on, you know, a lot, a lot of their moves, they might want to sit him and then, you know, play him for two to three years. And then with that extra year, you have another year to check, check him out, you know, uh, to extend your warranty, so to speak, on your investment. And then... Um, Without that, it just it, it handicaps you, but and of course it comes at a price because you know those, especially with a quarterback, those positions are cheap. It's the average of the the, the top ten contracts of that uh, that player's position, but it's well worth it in the long run because it's still I mean, a lower number than what they would actually get paid on the open market as a free agent. Um, but you control that uh, you control the, their availability and uh, you know the where they play so it's a smart move um for the most part for teams all right number five the eagles have six picks in the 2023 draft and 12 in the 2024 draft we just spoke about that um as such logic might dictate that they will try to use some 2024 picks to add to the 2023 draft capital however the eagles don't devalue future picks as much as other teams around the league so how do the eagles balance using future picks to move up or do whatever to add to the draft capital in the current year versus making sure they get the appropriate value of those future picks so um, they go to speak on about here about it here, but you know most teams devalue future picks by like a round or so. So if it's a future one, they're willing to uh, equate it to about you know the value of a current t number two. And the Eagles don't operate on that mode, so they're not willing to trade with teams because that leaves them at a disadvantage with you know their future picks. They they see them as you know, the same value, if not more valuable, um, because they. We were always trying to think, you know, two, three steps ahead. And, uh, you know, with the way Howard Rosen sees the salary cap, he lays down, you know, dummy years and um, spreads, you know, the, the cap hit over three, four, five, as many years as he can. So um, he's always thinking about the future. And he has a, basically a credit card <laughs> he's swiping with, um, to, you know, pay off that balance. So he has to juxtaposition the future and the present um, and make sure that he's not uh, going to over overdraw and uh, come up bankrupt on that balance. 
So, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a careful balancing act. And, um, yeah, with, with that being said, like, he said, like they're saying here, team, unless we trade with a team that equally values that, so we're not going to get shafted um, with the valuation of those picks, it's just not smart to borrow from Peter to pay off Paul because Paul's going to be like, I want a premium interest now for what, you, you know, what I'm offering, what I'm giving you. I'm going to want more from you than what usually the market market should dictate. And that's just going to be a losing battle. So you don't want to, unless, you know, unless it's just a special case, you don't want to dip too much into your future savings, your rainy day fund when, you know, you're going to need that. You, you know that you're going to need that sometime in the near future. So, all right, number six, now that Jalen Hurts is a $255 million man, damn, paid, whether it's schematics or coaching or personal personnel changes how did the eagles make sure that he stays healthy so for me this investment is simple run the ball more um surround him with weapons as, as many as possible so you just have to worry about him being a point guard just distributing that ball out there whether that be to a tight end and tight end number two uh, receiver receiver num uh, number two receiver number three maybe receiver number four if you have that you know talent to be able to spread defense defenses out that much and obviously with a running back Running back too, if you maybe get them on, on the uh, field at the same time, but being and then having all those guys and being as multiple as possible, playing in twenty personnel, playing in twenty-one personnel, um, two tight ends, two backs, um, spread five wide receivers. So I mean, like whatever it does, or whatever whatever you you know it does to defenses that you know put you at it in an advantageous position or whatever um, hits the hardest. I mean, whatever strategy works the best. And allows you to manipulate the defense, but also not become redundant, not become predictable. So, I mean, um, you don't want to take the ball out of his hands. He's going to touch the ball every play. But if you can reduce the wear and tear, of course, we're going to still run the read option. But why not get a generational talent like Bijan to place behind him, next to him, so that you can securely hand, that, hand the ball off. And he's going to get positive yardage, put, put us in um, short downs and distances and allow us to open up by, by you know, way of that, open up the, the playbook and um, give us more versatility to attack teams with, become less predictable and become more dangerous. So, I mean, it just moves us closer to the direction of unstoppable. But that's my take on it. All right, number seven, the Eagles have had the lowest snap count in the NFL last year from the rookies and got to the Super Bowl. How does that factor into the way the team looks at the draft in terms of a player contributing in year one? I mean, like he said here, how he's Roseman said, uh, it was kind of a uh, outlier of a year because we didn't have so many injuries, which is just rare. We started all 22 starters from, you know, the season opener to uh, the Super Bowl, which just usually doesn't happen. Um, and we redshirted more guys than usual. Like our first, second, and third picks all weren't heavy contributors. Like Jordan Davis, he was getting there and then had an injury and backed him up, backed up his progress, stalled his progress. Um, but even with that, he was still in a rotation, you know, not really, a, not, not a sorry at all, um, behind Fletcher Cox and, uh, Javon Hargrave, but he was a key player that we had coming in rotation and we just had stalwarts, you know, like on, on defense and, and, and the offense as well. Jason, uh, Kelsey, um, we weren't going to come in. He wasn't going to be replaced. Cam Jurgens got some, you know, valuable experience sitting behind him. And learning now he's gonna go move to right guard play a pivotal position for us as a starter um nicobe dean gonna be counted on most likely as well as a starter in that linebacker rotation when he learned behind uh, kazir white and tj edwards last year and then um jordan davis gonna get more ro rotations out he's yet to be seen if he's gonna be a starter or not but his snap snap in count and his impact will be um increased and more more of it will be expected of him so um that's just an advantageous position we were put in being able to redshirt those guys and but they're gonna be counting on this year that is that is key they're being they are being counted on this year to contribute so um with that being said i mean um with the attrition that we we had on both on the offensive side and the defensive side um you're gonna want guys that can come in immediately this this, this year if not start give you key contributions um to replace, mitigate some of that damage of, of loss, you know, that you, you suffered from, you know, teams picking over your roster from, you know, winning the Super Bowl to the uh, winners go to the spoils. And then after the winners are done, the vultures come and they pick the ball, they pick the body clean. So 
Um, luckily, we had some protectors. It's not, it's not, it wasn't a carcass, but we did lose some meat. All right, just looking a little bit here. That uh, yeah, I mean, like, eh, drafting. It's talking about O line depth. Yes, we can, but free agency. There's, as, we aren't gonna be able to address everything. So, identify guys in free agency, priority free agents, and um, guys you want to develop. We'll get to that a little bit later, um, because you do have the coaches. Number eight in the pre-draft process. How important to the Eagles is the process of trying to figure out what other teams are going to do? Um, it's very important. Um, they'll get they'll get to it later here, but being able to read the draft, man, something that Howie is adept at. He read it like a fucking book in twenty twenty one. They talk about um, when we had you know a couple picks that Howie Roseman was able to. Um, we had the number twelve pick, and we traded with, with Miami. We got their number one for the next year, and um, they got number six. And we trade, you know, we, we got a, we got a fourth and gave them our fifth, but. There was players that we wanted that we weren't able to get. Like for example, we were looking at potentially getting you know, like Kyle Pitts or Jamar Chase, but how he actually read a pick. If we stayed there, we would have got we would just miss out on Pitts and um, Jamar Chase back to back, and which you know would have sucked um, being in that position and you having to kind of make a pick that you weren't not really ready for, but you know like you're not even overdrafting. It would be a solid pick, but being able to recoup a you know number one that allowed us to get Jordan Davis the following year. Um, is is this a swing, a hell of a swing of a move, um, a hell of a swing of a trade, and like it, it's it's wild that um, they did that, and then J.C. Horn was available at number eight, and also Patrick Sertan went at number nine. Um, we would have been able to get either one of those players, but all things considered, I'm glad that we got who we got. We got Smitty, gave us a solid one one punch, one forget a one two one one punch at receiver with A.J. Brown being you know uh, traded for with that first and third. Uh, to the titans and it, it was just you know it um allowed us to uh catapult to a super bowl but um him being able to read that just expertly just wow you, you tip your hat and um he knows kind of like gives it you know it's a feel of what teams are gonna you know go after you know how things are gonna you know because the draft is like a it's like a sinking ship things are slowly falling apart um, cause it's not going to go down as expected. There's going to be, you know, uh, pitfalls and stuff like that. You know, boxes are going to be falling. People are going to be, you know, fall, uh, going over the guardrails and you got to be able to dodge and move. Um, or you're going to go down with the ship. <laughs> um, if you get, if you're a slave to the, the flow of the draft, you have to, you know, preemptively attack and, and be able to move and roll with the punches. And he does that just expertly. So, I mean, not a, a better reading of that. Just, yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't have, uh, pretty, pretty, not pretty better predicted it better, but um, I couldn't have encapsulated it any better than what they said there. So, um, yeah, it just, it, it worked out for us with that. And the Giants also wanted him. So we jumped ahead of the Giants, traded with the Cowboys, the division rival, which I just uh, love. And um, I mean, ideally they should have been traded, they should have been targeting, but you know, us knowing that a pick, uh, one pick behind would have been a pick too late because they were gonna get him they ended up trading, uh, trading back and getting uh, Kadarius Tony, who they traded off to the Chiefs. And they, you know, moved down to number twenty. So it just excellent, excellent reading of the room, or I should say, the uh, the building. Number nine. Do the Eagles bother with smoke screen, smoke screens? Yes, they do. And like, not saying anything is also a smoke screen. Smoke screen. Misleading people into what you know moves you're gonna make is a smoke screen. So it's it. But it, these are never things that how he's going to come out and admit, which just makes it all the more elegant and all the more masterful, masterstroke. Um, <laughs> but it's it's awesome because you don't have to say anything to get anything done. And, it's, and then just manipulating something by making the tiniest of a move or being still is just like the most genius <laughs> of moves you can make. It's like chess, you know, which is why I love it. Number 10, how the Eagles view the overall depth of this draft relative to previous drafts and how many players have first round grades? Um, yeah, Howie's never going to answer that. Because, and he's like, especially because we have two picks, I'm not going to answer this question um, in a giveaway. Um, you got to believe like 15 to 20 players, but um, and then they have their board put together, you know, who they want and whatnot. And they organize it, you know, priority, position. Um, oh, well, position. Position, well, I would say position is a need or 
position of, of, of maybe luxury that we could, we could have and then sit a guy for a year or two and then have him take over where it's not a luxury for him to play this year, kind of like we did have last year. Um, even though it wasn't predicted, it would go down like that. You just need depth behind starters. But it just, like I said, injury luck just happened to a holdout for us last year. But um, that being said, like, it's it, it's it's crazy because, like, you know, you, I know you, everybody's draft board is different. But we also don't see guys the way other guys see them um, because, you know, we'll get to it in, in the next one. But development plays such, such a key role. And there's been positions that we've been horrible at developing. And it's by no fault of the players that, you know, they came in and they weren't, um, they weren't, didn't have people in front of them to uh, seek counsel from. And yeah, you got your coaches and things like that, but you need to see it done on the field by like a peer of yours, um, a guy you call your um, superior, like your, your predecessor, um, to show you the ropes, to show you the way. And if you don't have that, man, it's, it's it can be really challenging just going off of coaching, just going off of film, but not seeing, having somebody to talk you through it that is at your position can give you that invaluable knowledge in, um, in their, you know, experience that they've had over several years in the league, things that they've learned, like small things, you know, from the routine to, uh, you know, picking up hints, clues, and, and breaking down analysis, uh, weaknesses of, of opponents, things like, things like that. That's invaluable. Um, but let's get to the last question here. What critical factors do the Eagles look for in their offensive alignment? So um, I love how he gets to it here. Like, guys have tools. And all, all five of our starting linemen, um, including last year, Isaac Sayamala, but now it's Cam Jurgens, who's center, but he's going to moonlight at uh, right guard most likely this year um, before Jason Kelsey most likely hangs up the, the cleats next year and allows him to take over at center. But they all have tools, but they're, they're still putty coming in. He's like, um, how Rosen says, if you're expecting these guys as 21, 22, 23, and sometimes 24-year-olds from this draft to come in and um, be finished products, you're a fool and they need to come in and, and be developed and that you know it's a like contingent of course on their want and their will um but you need to have coaches and as well like i said previously players at their positions to be able to lead and guide them help them in maturity then they got so many other things to worry about um make the process streamlined for them but people that can identify their weaknesses their, their you know their strengths show them you know the techniques and uh how to use their body their build their special tools that they have their you know either IQ, football iq their intelligence um how to film study i mean these are all things that are key to to them growing and adapting and maturing as players in the league but they don't have that um especially by way of coaching we have one of the best if not the best offensive line coaches in the game by uh, <laughs> jeff stoutland he is a knockout um he knows he can identify guys, you know, okay, well, like, I want this guy. He has these tools. Jordan Marlotta was a seventh-round pick, a throwaway, um, but he's developed into our starting left tackle because of the hours, the time that he's put in. But most importantly, um, having a guy like Stoutland who's been able to shape him from, you know, the raw, um, unrefined jewel to, um, you know, stone to this sparkling, bright, you know, blinding jewel who, I mean, just – is an absolute beast out there. Takes advantage of his uh, his physical skill set, but also has the mental part of the game, um, where he you know he's got his technique and his kick step, and he can anticipate and um, he can read defenses and and know where to be and um, know where to lay off and like, prevent penalties. It's, it's just a master class. So I mean, like um, being able to identify those guys, not just how how they would fit with us. Um, but you know, who and what they, they are and what they can be is just as important. And this wraps up the article, man, just an excellent article. Um, he's going to dive into kind of this last question here once they extend it and, uh, kind of extrapolate more information, uh, you know, about it and analy analyze it, which is excellent, but we're going to get to the, you know, things around the league here. So not that many because, uh, it's draft week, pretty much, um, Sunday night for here for me, but yeah, it's going to be Monday tomorrow. Countdown begins. But um, a few things around the league. Micah Hyde builds to bounce back after the disappointing 2022. Him and Poyer, you know, the uh, safety set actually used to, I think, both be Philadelphia Eagles players, which is ironic, funny. But, um, yeah, like, they um, – I mean, definitely Jordan Poyer. I don't know about Micah Hyde. I forget. But, um, yeah, you, you, a sore – I mean, uh, a poor – a nasty taste left in your mouth. 
after the way the you know season ended and you know you got to find a way to beat those strong AFC pillars being the Bengals and the Chiefs if, if Josh Allen can overcome them he's not going anywhere near that championship uh Super Bowl uh game so uh, yeah it, they uh ended on a sour note so I want to say earlier but they're going to try to reassemble hopefully the injury look plays out in their favor that you know hoping that and you know see what they can do where they can go how far they can go um and let's see there's only a couple of things I want to look at so I mean like uh Derrick Henry talk KGB the supposed agent <laughs> um former Green Bay uh, Packers uh rusher a uh, defensive end talking about he has insider knowledge that you know King Henry is going to get traded to the Philadelphia Eagles and I, I call bullshit because what it, it, he's got one year left on on his deal he's 29 years old got so much tread on the tire 1700 career carries um already been out a couple years you know with with season and injuries um it was solid last year but you know he, he could hit that wall any day now and he's starting to slow down it's evident you're looking at you know the film um and why go with him and you can go with someone like Bijan, 21 years old just turned 21 in january um fresh come, late, let's come into the league idiot people saying like, oh he, he's unproven of course he's unproven everybody's unproven until they come to the NFL, nfl and they're able to apply themselves to the trade are you fucking stupid how else would they come in and 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 uh, get better. Nobody's a ready-made product coming to the NFL. Very few are. Like Adrian Peterson hit the ground running, but even he has mistakes. Go back and look at the film that he could improve upon upon his rookie, uh, rookie year. That they were they were errors, but it, somehow he made it work. You know, or somehow you know like, uh, he make he jicked the guy and made up for that. But it's still an error is an error. A coach is gonna still celebrate. You know, but at the end of the day, let's clean that up in the offseason. Let's uh, analyze this. Just look pour for the film. And sometimes you got to throw it out because they ain't, okay, the result, you know, results are everything. But that being said, there's still areas that he had to improve upon upon his rookie year. And he still never became like a complete receiver. He was an option out of the backfield. But, you know, Bijan, like, Derrick Henry is not going to slot and fool anybody. He's not a superior receiver to Bijan right now. And he's, a, he's just a rookie. This guy can run routes like a receiver, run most of the route tree. So, I mean, like, it's it's crazy that people have that talk. And then he's just, he's older. He's more prone to injury. He's cost he's costly. 10 million. Bijan, even if, I, don't, I believe it's going to be four, between, somewhere between four and five million. But let's just say he comes in with five million a year or four years. That's 20 million. Half of what King Henry is owed this one year. And it's a one-year rental. And then we're back at reset. We uh, we lose Henry. Um, game goes now down to a year. And then we have um, Richard Penny out. He's going to go on most likely the greener pastures, price himself out of Philadelphia. So, I mean, like, it's just dumb. I'm, I'm tired of hearing about this fucking dumb discussion. I, just, I mean, like, it's just not going to happen. And then we haven't even talked about the draft capital it's going to take to get him. We can use that elsewhere. So, I mean, it's just nuts. Like, the short-sightedness. It's funny. People are like, oh, it's so short -shot, short sighted to draft Bijan. No, it's short-sighted to get... Anyways, I'm done, man. All right, last thing we'll get to, draft night trades. Look out because, man, people, there are people on the trading block right now. Buda Baker? Can it be had? Maybe. Um, we shall see. But there's going to be a lot of moving movers and shakers looking to make some noise um, around the NFL. There are going to be guys that we didn't think were available because, you know, teams are playing, paying lip service right now, saying, like, oh, this guy, you know, we're not moving and we don't intend. All the while, they're, you know, they're making moves. They get in the back of the head machinations are, are they're scheming they're schemers as joker would say and um you know it, it things will go down and we, we shall see some some guys uh, swap colors swap jerseys swap divisions swap conferences but that is yet to be seen but i'm excited draft week is almost here so let's continue to uh, go at it anyways get about here you're not even watching let's be honest it's all good, though, because as I always say, it's fly, eagles fly, and let's motherfucking go! Thanks for watching. Check me out at Cintron, Cintron Anime, Cintron Life, or Cintron Laughs, or other social media.